<laughs> so we're going to try to make this fun for everybody. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself and then um, we're part of the, the dynamic duo Turo Graduate Medical Education. So I'm Dr. Nevins. I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education and Program Development. Um, just a little bit of my background. I was a residency program director for 12 years. In the past, uh, I'm dual board in family medicine and neuromusculoskeletal medicine, and also a colonel in the Army Reserve and work with our active duty reserves and even our veterans with the VA as well. And I'll let uh, Dr. Lynn introduce herself. So nice to have you all here. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. May Lynn, and I am the Assistant Dean of Graduate Medical Education at Toro University, California. I am board certified in family medicine and neuromuscular skeletal medicine. And uh, just, we're really happy to be here and to share some of our uh, conversations around how to teach students um, and still be very productive as a clinician. So um, can everybody see the slide? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so um, we're just going to advance, let me try. So here are our objectives that we're going to cover today. We won't read them to you. Really, the goal for us is just to give you some tools in your toolbox. And if you have had learners in your practice before, whether they were medical students, PA students, nurse practitioner students, residents, or if you've never had them before, these are all tools that will just help you to be a more effective preceptor. Obviously, if you, those of you who know that Rural Healthy California has got their psychiatry residency program, and now hopefully family medicine will get its approvals, so we'll have two residency programs in the area. And we're just so excited to partner with all of you to give you support in the process of having learners in your practice. We know it can be a little scary in the whole process. And just know that literally for, for Dr. Lynn and I, our job is to hold hands um, and support you in the process. So if there's anything that from today you're like, I'm just unsure about how I might actually integrate learners into my practice. You can reach out to us independently and we're happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one and kind of discuss how to do those things. But we think that by the end of today, you'll see that it's not so scary and that it's so important to have learners in, our, in your practice. It's going to actually be a force multiplier. It gives you more patient satisfaction. But also we are now creating the pathway, hopefully even from K through 12, to then from there on to uh, whether, whatever their college of choice is to medical school and then on back to this area to practice. Because we all know we have to build the, the next generation of healthcare providers that are gonna take care of all of you who live in this community. And I, I try not to use cliches too much, but if you build it, they will come. And so that is really what we wanna do is if they train here, they wanna stay here. So we're so excited to get to know all of you and please don't hesitate at the end to ask any questions or you can drop them in the chat if you don't wanna unmute and we will try to address all those at the end. So thank you and welcome. So we, we all have a lot of responsibilities and patient care that we have to um, attend to. And sometimes it can feel a little intimidating to have learners in our busy schedules. How else are we gonna add one more thing to our plate? Well, we, we're here today to tell you how it can be done in a way that's efficient. And instead of learners being something that might be um, a taxing on time, uh, we're gonna attempt to show you that learners can actually save you time while you're seeing patients. Next slide. So the question always comes back down to how am I going to actually have learners in my practice and not be able to meet my bottom line? And when we talk about how we integrate learners, let's kind of walk you through some of the processes and how that would look. So for example, and for those of you who have MAs or nurses in your practice who actually go and get the patients from the waiting room, they room them, they get their vitals, uh, they usually get a subjective. Well, all of those things are appropriate for your learner to do, which means now your MA or nurse are actually freed up to do other things that they need to get done. And it's important for those learners, regardless of what flavor it is, for them to actually see the dynamics of the patient and family in the waiting room, because we can find that that's very interesting. 
but also they're getting to improve their skills to do all of the other pieces that are going to be part of their practice for the future and overseeing the next generation of learners that they may be taking care of as well in the future. They're not a ball and chain that's attached to you 24 seven. So the whole idea here, and we're going to kind of walk you through those pieces is that everyone in your practice has something to teach those learners. And they're really gonna help you to maximize your time, allow you to really work with your patients that need you. But I'm gonna guess if I could get a, I mean, obviously we can't raise hands very easily here, but you all have patients that you know take much more time and you wish you could give them more time. And the hard part is you can't always give them the more time that they want, but your learners can. And that increases patient satisfaction because we know Patients just want to be heard. And that's the beauty of being able to have learners in your practice. So what are some of the things that we can help our learner to integrate into the office? What kind of jobs can they take on? You know, it, learners, we can be really creative in this process because learners don't have to stick right with the attending physician. Healthcare really is a team sport. And there are many parts of a patient's medical care that the learner can really come in and help. If you have a patient who needs a quick EKG, if you need to do a blood draw, those are wonderful things for learners to learn um, in your clinics. And so that can also help to save time for your staff and to allow them to get onto other patients or sicker patients. And ultimately, when we're talking about how we prepare the team, it's really about communication. So if everyone in the team knows what their role is going to be and how they're going to work with the learner, you have your nurse or your MA teaching the students if they've never done EKGs before, how to do it, how to set it up properly, how to do blood draws. I can promise you after COVID, I don't know of any students that are not really, really good at vaccinations, so they can certainly help with those pieces of it. There's a lot of, of, of really wonderful aspects that free up people's time and allow you to be more productive. So while you may see three patients, the student or the, the resident may see one or two, and they're still gonna have to present to you. And for some of you, you may not be aware that everything that the student and the resident does is billable. You do still have to see your patient for the key components of that. You do have to write a piece of, your, of the note, not just that you agree with above, but some key findings that you had from your own piece of the examination, but you don't have to rewrite the entire note. You're also going to say to yourself, well, what do you do on busy days? How do you manage uh, the learners when, let's say, it's a flu or a COVID, new COVID outbreak, right? And now all of a sudden you've got way more patients that you need to see in that day. Well, it doesn't mean that that day they can't also help with scribing, which we all think would be awesome because then we're not having to fight with the EMR in the process of trying to get that face-to-face -face time with our patients. But if we talk about how do they, how are you going to handle those different days, they know that ahead of time. We're a big fan of actually saying videotape your orientation the first time you have learners in your practice, and that way you can walk them through what the practice looks like, who the people are, what the expectations are, what your EMR is. They, if you've got some little learning modules, they can even do that before they get to you. So the more we prepare your, your, your team and the learner, the better it is, the more transparent it is, and the easier the transition. In addition to having a clear uh, expectations and process for integrating the learner into the practice, um, there are some suggestions that we're gonna share in this um, talk about how we might want to structure that. Um, one thing that we can try to use as a handout, really being clear about expectations on your part and expectations on the learner's part as well. Um, Dr. Nevin spoke on perhaps considering videotaping the orientation so that when you have your second and third learner, you don't have to repeat that same information. So we're gonna next show you an example of a goal sheet that you might want to go through with a learner. So start by just talking and explaining your day-to-day -day patient flow with the learner. How would you respond when there is any kind of emergent situation, you might not be able to be there. If that is the case, um, is there a contingency plan in place? If you, for example, are an OBGYN and had an emergency C-section that you had to attend to and really could not wait for the learner to come with you to the hospital, what are other things that they might be able to do, perhaps with a colleague or um, 
someone else in the office while you have to go and attend to an emergent situation and, and be back shortly. So um, another uh, component is to just observe your learner. You know, what skill level are they at in their learning process? And make it a point to go through that patient encounter, especially on the first day. Set that tone um, early to understand expectations. And so we had spoken a little bit earlier about maybe putting something in writing to get a sense of what the goals are and what are the expectations. So sometimes it helps to just have structure to be able to have these conversations. And um, one example is this learning contract that we have pictured here, uh, going through different aspects of what the student would like to get out of the rotation, what the preceptor's goals are, and get on the same page about that. Um, and use some kind of structure to be able to be in alignment on that. You know, I'm a, a big fan of making sure, and I think from just educational standpoint, the more that the learner knows how you're going to give them feedback and speak to them and work with them and train them, the better you're going to be able to communicate with each other back and forth. And some of you may or may not remember a TV show called Emergency and there was a, an attending that I think we all wished we had as attendings when we went through our training, which was Mark Rain. And what I'll say to you is whether you remember this person or not, we all have the, the attending that we trained under who was that model that we all wish every rotation was with that attending because that person was compassionate. They were educated. They were firm. They gave us right and left limits, but they gave us functional feedback, not just criticism. Told us when we were doing things well, told us when we needed to fix things, never embarrassed us in front of other people, allowed us to recognize that we are all in a learning status at that point. And reality is if we knew everything, we wouldn't need to be there. So it's okay to not know everything, but to ask questions and acknowledge when you don't know something, because obviously we need patient safety. Compare that to the, our next option, which would be perhaps the not great perceptor that you've ever had before. And if anybody ever watched House, maybe the most brilliant diagnostician there is, but does anybody really want to work with the jerk who constantly tells you you're an idiot? Nobody does. And we joke with our students and residents that if anybody feels like they need more judgment in their life, come on up and we'll all judge you. That doesn't help people learn. And actually we know the more that we, we hit them with negativity, the more their brain shuts down. So recognize for yourself, what are some of those great qualities and people that gave you a good example? What did you learn from the people who are a bad example? And that helps you to kind of set the tone that you want to set for whatever learner kind that you're going to have in your practice. Let's talk a little bit about learning styles. I think most of us recognize that we may have a specific learning style that we are attracted to or that where we learn best. Um, there are different styles of learning, including visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Um, and most of us probably have a combination of these. So let's ask ourselves, you know, as this, if I am the student or if I am the learner, what kind of learning style do I have? And what kind of methods help me to learn best? Ask yourself as the learner, uh, how do you learn? Do you need some visual cues? Do you need somebody to tell you uh, and because you're auditory? Do you need to touch things because you're kinesthetic? And how does this learning style affect how you instruct and how your learner learns? How do we put those two things together? So when we talk about teaching models, there is no one size fits all. And I think it's really important for us to remember that is that we are going to be affected by our own learning style because that's how we think everybody learns. But it's so important to recognize as an educator that although we all know our eyes lie to us because we've got, you know, these these empty spots that our brain fills in for us. Well, we do this all the time. We presume that everybody sees green the way I see green, but they don't. So if we recognize that and we speak to it and you say to the, to the learner, student or resident, do you know what your learning models are? What do you do know how you learn? How do you learn best? What techniques have helped you to remember information? Again, it's all about that wonderful dialogue we have with the learner that doesn't mean you have to spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with them to get those pieces. If that initial interaction with them just says, hey, do you know what your learning style is? How do you learn best? 
you need to communicate with me as, as the preceptor that if you're not getting something, don't nod and make me think you did understand it. Tell me you didn't so we can address how best to help you learn the material we're talking about. So if we keep those things in mind, it really does work. We're gonna go through different learning models um, that we can integrate. And again, this is some level of structure that gives um, us a way to assess learners, to go through steps, to make sure that we are um, interacting and connecting and working toward a common goal. So one of the uh, models that we're gonna share with you today, we have a couple that we're, sh we're gonna share, but we're gonna start with the five-step micro skills model. It's also commonly known as the one minute preceptor. And this is when you go through five steps um, when you are interacting with the learner. Uh, the learner sees a patient, assesses the patient, and then presents to you the attending physician. Um, and the physician really helps to coach the learner through these different components, getting a commitment, probe for supporting evidence, and others, which we'll go through one by one. So first, let's talk about the first step, getting a commitment. So let's make sure that our learner feels invested. Let's try to get a commitment from them uh, through a patient case that we just encountered. So we want to challenge the learner to commit to some aspect of the case. And we could ask questions like, what do you think is going on with the patient? And what kind of information do you think is needed? What type of treatments do you think that this patient needs? The second step of this process is to probe for supporting evidence. You want to ask questions like, what were some of the major findings that you went through that led you to this conclusion? And what else did you consider in this patient case? As you allow these questions to, if as you ask these questions, you allow the learner to think through the case and it may allow you some insight into areas where there may be gaps um, and that you can identify and talk through later on. It's good in this process to try to avoid grilling the learner as if you're conducting some kind of oral examination. We all have probably experienced some kind of pimping session, which was an old term that was used, and it's it's familiar to us, but I want to put it in the medical context um, of when an attending physician asks a series of questions to the learner to try to assess their knowledge. Now, many of us may have experienced these sessions to be uh, really nerve wracking, uh, didn't instill confidence in our ability to learn more and might've scared some of us. And we wanna be careful not to do this to our learners that we want to instill positivity and instill a sense of uh, safe learning environment where they're feeling like if there is a gap that they are aware of that they feel comfortable coming to you and telling you about it. So the third step of this is to teach some general rules. So as some of the gaps become obvious as you talk through a case, you might want to provide some general rules of thumb for treating certain conditions. So for example, if a patient has cystitis, um, you'll talk through some of the symptoms like pain with urination or increased frequency. And you may want to tell them, hey, you can also sometimes see blood and urine with these conditions and just insert some of those general rules with this diagnosis. Step number four, reinforce what was done right. In this conversation and discussing the patient case and, and having dialogue with the learner, you might be able to see that there's a lot that the learner did well. And in these instances, you want to reinforce the positive so that they feel encouraged and that they can go to the next step of analysis and learning. So say for example, you can say, the patient, you didn't jump, you did this well. And the reason why you did this well is that you didn't jump into solving the presenting problem, but you kept an open mind until the patient revealed her real agenda for coming in today. So be specific about what the learner did right, how they acted in a way that was helpful to the patient and keep this conversation focused. Step number five, when you do identify those gaps, it's okay to correct mistakes. That's what the learner th is there for. There are a couple of um, principles that can help this process. Timing is important. So as soon as you identify this, try to say something. 
find a place that is appropriate, a setting, you know, maybe it's better to do this on a one-on-one -on -one basis in a private setting so the learner doesn't feel like he or she is being called out and try to allow the learner space to identify what they did wrong and how they might correct this error in the future. Again, it's helpful when these comments are timely, specific, and focused. And I think I, one of the things I wanna make sure that everybody's clear on is this may sound like, wow, this is gonna take forever to do. It's called the one minute preceptor because it's supposed to be one minute, right? The whole intention is, is that your learner, whether they're a student or resident, should be coming in and giving you that 30 second, maybe one minute max presentation on subjective object, objective assessment and plan. They did their whole soap in front of you and when you recognize that maybe you know this patient, you're like, yeah, I already know you missed something. So now you can ask for, well, how did you come to that conclusion? And we're talking about keeping it under one minute of those probing questions. And really then you're gonna go see the patient with the, the, the learner. After you see the patient, you're gonna come out and go, so now that we've had this discussion, how do you wanna adjust your assessment? How do you wanna adjust your plan? And if you see that there's still gaps in that knowledge, you're like, well, it looks like you don't really understand congestive heart failure. So how about you read up on that and we'll talk about that tomorrow, next patient. So this is not meant to be, oh my God, I'm gonna give an entire lecture to the student or the resident about this aspect because you're still the one deciding what the final assessment plan is gonna be and what's documented in the chart. The power of uh, model of active precepting is very against another, another tool for your toolbox. What I will tell you, the nice thing is, whichever model you use, tell the, the learner what you're using. This is how I'm gonna communicate with you. This is how you want I want you to communicate back with me. So we can go through the different pieces of the power model. But again, you may find that this is about giving that proactive, timely, and, and interactions that are more digestible bites more frequently. And it totally depends on what is your practice like. Are you? divided between the hospital and the clinic? Are you just in the clinic? Are you just in the hospital? So these are just tools and know that much like anything else, we all have opinions. Well, it's the same thing with all these models. They've all been validated with studies to show that they work, but it's gonna be you as the educator that's gonna figure out what works best for you, or it may be a combo of those things, or maybe after learning five different kinds of models, you make your own, but whatever works for you is what matters. So this one begins with power. So we start with prepare. This is really, again, we talk about how do you set up your, your session if it's in clinic or the ho a hospital? Are you doing a morning report? Are you doing a huddle? But if everybody knows what they are bringing to the table at the beginning, makes it so simple. We get to then educate. That means now, remember we just did those that one minute preceptor. This can be a way that you use to educate on a specific thing related to the patient encounter orchestrate. You're going to circulate around, make sure that especially if you actually are working with more residents where you have a one to four ratio where they're seeing patients and you're just kind of circulating around, and that gives you an opportunity to give each one of those learners the assistance they need as they see the patients. Review. That means really at the end of the day, and we're not talking about this being an hour diatribe about everything that happened, but just kind of close the session for the end of the day. That is really about five minutes. What went well? Everybody gets to give feedback. What went well? What didn't go so well? What do we need to change for tomorrow? Are there things people should be reading in preparation for tomorrow because you saw some gaps in knowledge? And this just allows everybody to feel like they kind of culminated the, the event of the day to prepare for the next day. This is really useful when we think about it from the standpoint is you don't have to be a, a driving information into the learner, but instead being an active coach. Now we're getting them to be self-aware and self-directed learners and aware of what they need to learn where their own gaps or knowledge are. And now you get to coach them, which takes a lot less time and it's a whole lot more fun. The additional one is the SNAPS model. SNAPS is pretty straight, straightforward as well. And again, it's similar to the five-step micro skills model. And here's just a summary of what each one of those things states. You'll notice this is one of my, actually one of my favorites because it's super simple. And if you literally took a, a picture of this one screenshot, put it on the wall, and you said to the learner, I want you to summarize the case, give me the narrow differential, analyze it, and then I'm going to I'm gonna ask you to justify it, give me your, your plan, and then now I'm going to tell you what things you need to do for your self-directed learning. 
If this is how you approach a learner and it's up on the wall and they know exactly how to present, you can see how quickly that information can be disseminated from the learner to the preceptor and back and forth. We won't go, I won't beat you up with all these pieces. We're just gonna run through them quickly, but again, summarize the facts of the visit, narrow that differential like we discussed. And ideally you wanna get them to no more than three because that's realistic. That's what we're trying to do is what are my top things? What's gonna kill my patient first? What's the most important differentials I need to have? We try to get them to think, don't go zebra on me. Keep the, keep the horses if I'm hearing hoofbeats really focus on those pieces. Now, obviously, sometimes we do have zebras, and then that's the appropriate time for everybody to go more in depth or do some additional research and try to figure out what's going on. Analyze. So they have to prove to you, persuade you why their differential is correct. So it's not your job to ask them all the questions. Their job now is to explain to you exactly what their justification is for why they have picked the differentials that they have. And this is the probe, right? So this is the another educational step for the learner. And that means they get to initiate questions specifically about that case. And this helps to make sure we're all on the same page as we're talking about what the issues are for your specific patient. And then plan, right? This always means that they have to think about what that management looks like and the second and third order effects of what that plan looks like. And if you see that they're not doing that, that's an opportunity for a teaching moment. And then we just say, okay, well, now you've recognized maybe they didn't know CHF very well, or they didn't know cystitis very well, or they kind of missed something completely as a differential. Here's a great opportunity to say, well, it looks like you missed this piece. This should have been in your differential. So I want you to read up why I'm saying that, and you can tell me tomorrow what you learned from that. And this is a really great way for the to learner to recognize their own self-awareness, their own weaknesses and their strengths, and be able to fill in those knowledge gaps. Ultimately, remember you as a preceptor offer the one thing that a medical school and the residency itself may not have, it's the patient. So you are there to make sure the patient is taken care of and allow that learner to have the experience of working with that patient. This is all about practical experience. This is a really one great one to do that I would say day one of a third year medical student, snaps might be a little bit hard for them to gather, uh, but a day one resident, should be okay because they just finished their fourth year. So as you get to know your learner in the first day of watching them do a physical exam, watching them interact with the patient, you get a sense of where they are and how sophisticated they are and whether you can you need to be a little more directed or you can be more of a coach as your learner progresses through their training. And again, the whole idea here is really that this is just another opportunity for you to have tools in your toolbox to figure out what's gonna work for you and it's really nice if, again, you put it up on the wall, you don't have to coach them through the steps. They know exactly what to present back to you. And we always love to give research. So if you actually want to see that what we're talking about is not BS, <laughs> this is these are studied models. And here's one of the examples in academic medicine that shows it actually does help with clinical reasoning and uncertainties. Again, like I said before, this is really great when we're talking about having a little bit more sophisticated learner and really helping them to get that diagnostic reasoning and not just regurgitate what this symptom is, then that means these are these differentials. Can you explain to me exactly how you got? What is the reasoning behind what you did? So we're, we're not just telling them to, to do rote memorization, but to think like a doctor and be able to assess the information they have in front of them. The next model is the what if model. So this is actually one of my favorites because all you have to do is to pretty much throw in a little wrench into a patient case. And that helps the patient, the learner to think about the patient case in a completely different context. So let's just give an example to illustrate what the what if model is. If a patient, if a learner is seeing a patient who is 10 years old versus if that what if that patient is 65 years old. Well, what if that patient is a newborn? So when we are able to just kind of ask the what if question to a case that already exists, it expands the learner's ability to see different viewpoints on how they might approach a patient scenario. So use the what if model 
um, in different scenarios where uh, you could when, when the learner is giving a presentation and they have a common condition and it's a maybe a newer learner could use this model a little bit more than the one that was described before. And let's say somebody has a cold. Uh, the patient came in with a typical viral URI and well, what if that patient had a history of hypertension? Would you be able to give that patient X medication? What if that patient has a history of heart disease? How does that look change the way you approach this patient? I'm gonna pull in another example is, what if that patient uh, came from a area that maybe didn't have uh, a whole lot of, maybe the patient came from a different country and what if that patient came from this country? Do we have cultural competency to be able to understand how to approach this patient um, and allow them to build that trust with us as clinicians? So ultimately, you know, as we look at all these different models, the goal is to give you tools in your toolbox, figure out what works for you, get to know your learner, and figure out how best to help them grow and develop as a, as a practitioner for the future, because they may well be the ones taking care of us someday when we show up in the hospital or the clinic. But our, our focus for, for you today is just to hopefully we inspire you that you don't have to do this alone. And learners will actually, you will have happy patients because they get to have more face-to-face -face time. You're gonna have happier staff because they have an opportunity to get some breaks, but also do some teaching themselves and see how, how much their feedback and their teaching is necessary for the next generation of healthcare providers. Since we are doing a team sport, we want them to have respect for the biller, for the coder, for the MA, for the nurse, your PA, the nurse practitioner. We want them to look at this as the team sport that it is. So we really have great opportunities as we bring learners into the practice, but Dr. Lynn and I want you to know that you are not alone. And so if you have questions or you're not sure how you're going to manage some of these pieces, or you're just afraid of how you're going to get your staff to be ready to do this, these are all things that we can help you kind of transition those aspects so you can feel confident in having the learners in your practice. I additionally want to remind you, especially for medical students, that it is not the responsibility of the preceptor for the education solely of that student. Every medical school that's out there, we are responsible for the curriculum and the education of those students. The preceptor, what you're offering is the patient encounter that the university doesn't have. Separate from that, students have shelf exams that they have to take at the end of each of the rotation blocks to show that they've got mastery of the material. They have their board exams they have to, have to take, but they have longitudinal curriculum related to each of the specialties that they have to continue to read, do questions on, be prepared, do other presentations, OSCEs, observe structured clinical ex examinations, all of those key, key points are the responsibility of the university. Same thing for the residency program. They're tracking the milestones for each of those residents, looking at them from novice to mastery and what they're gonna look like in that process and deciding whether they are progressing appropriately through their training. Again, your job is to offer that direct patient care experience and to help direct those learners so they become the best, the best professionals they, they possibly can for the future. future. I, I know, know you, you can read, read and this is one of my favorite quotes, and I'm just going to read it because I love it so much. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, and do more, and become more, you are a leader. And what I want to tell you is all of you are leaders and educators for your patients, but also for the next generation of healthcare providers. And so we're so excited to be on this journey with you. And, and we hope that you'll reach out if you have any questions. And we're happy to answer any now. You can unmute or drop them in chat, but we're just so excited to be on this journey with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And um, in this format, we want to just give some time to for any of those who have questions to unmute and go ahead and just speak and we can have a discussion. Maybe you can think of a time where you had a learner and something happened and it, this is a great time to talk about it among colleagues. Um, maybe you feel a little bit like unsure whether or not you could manage integrating a learner into your practice and you have some fears around it. Uh, let's talk about it, have discussion about how we might be able to support one another. So uh, feel free to unmute and speak or drop any comments into the chat. 
and we will wait. And there's no dumb questions and we don't judge either. So we love the, <laughs> the judgment in the door. So, so don't, don't feel, feel afraid to, to reach out and ask questions today. And if you just don't feel comfortable in this environment, this arena, please reach out individually so that we can help you as well. I think we'll hand it back to Bridget too to see if there's anything else you'd like to add. Well, thank you for joining. And thank you to Dr. Lynn and Dr. Nevins for this wonderful presentation. And again, you can always contact me. I have their contact information. So thank you very much. Again, thank you to Enlo for providing the CME and have a great afternoon. And we've dropped our uh, emails into the chat. So if you'd like to copy, we'd be happy to. Yes, we'd be happy to get you a copy of the slides so we can make those available to Bridget. And if you just reach out or send us an email directly, we'll be happy to send you a copy. Okay, well, thank you. And we will talk soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.